I'm with uh, TJ's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. Um, we have with us tonight, as you know, a couple of very distinguished journalists uh, who represent their papers, the Times of London and the New York Times. Martin Fackler is the Tokyo Bureau Chief of the New York Times. He's been in Japan uh, with the New York Times from 2005 and is the Tokyo Business Correspondent before assuming his current position as the Tokyo Bureau Chief of the Times in 2009. In 2012, um, his reportage of the Fukushima nuclear crisis and the aftermath of 311 resulted in him being nominated as a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize, along with his colleagues Nori Onishi and Hiroka Tabuchi. Um, Martin has been doing a lot of work on not only the nuclear crisis, but on the way the press coverage has covered this. Um, one moment, I'm going to pop this down because it's. He has recently written a book. He's the author of a book called Credibility Lost, the Crisis in Japanese Newspaper Journalism After Fukushima, which is a critical look at the Japanese media coverage after the uh, earthquake and nuclear crisis. Richard Lloyd Perry is the Asia editor of, of the Times of London. Um, after working as a, a freelance journalist, he's lived in Japan since 1995 as a foreign correspondent, first for the Independent, now the Times. He's reported from 27 countries, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, and uh, Macedonia. In recent years, he's covered the crisis in North Korea, also the nuclearization in Burma, for which he's written a book, and the Japanese uh, tsunami nuclear crisis. He's currently working also on a, a book related to the tsunami. He's been named the Foreign Correspondent of the Year in the UK, and has been shortlisted for the World Prize, including other awards. He's also the author of a book um, about a, a famous case in which a, a, a hostess was killed called uh, People Who Eat Darkness. Uh, this evening, they are going to give brief comments of, about their reportage, and then we're going to have a very extended Q&A. Um, I ask that uh, when you do get involved in the Q&A that you wait for the microphone and that you ask questions rather than give speeches, and uh, I think we're going to have a very interesting dialogue. So I'd like to welcome Richard Lloyd Perry, and Martin Thackle. Thank you. Okay, is that about the right distance? Good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for coming out, and thank you, Carl, for that um, embarrassingly fulsome introduction. I'm afraid I'm going to fall short of your expectations. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm Martin, having written a book on the subject, is, is really an expert on this. I'm, I couldn't say I'm an expert. Of course, I, I work within the media industry and have done for my career. So perhaps the best that I can do here is to share a little bit of my personal experience of reporting this disaster and try and draw a few points and conclusions out of that. And there will no doubt be many things which I omit or miss out, and I hope you'll feel free to, to raise those during our discussion afterwards. Like many of you know, Dad, I was in Tokyo when the, the earthquake struck that Friday afternoon. And I, after spending hours and hours writing the initial stories the next day's paper, I went straight up there the following morning in a car with other colleagues uh, and drove for basically 24 hours until we got to, to Sendai because the expressways were down and the, the main roads were, were very busy and clogged. And on and off I probably spent most of two weeks uh, reporting on the, really on the, on the tsunami. I was based mostly in Sendai and driving out on day trips to the stricken towns up and down that coast. Um, and funnily enough, um, Someone in that situation, like myself, had a strangely uh, occluded view of what was going on. Um, it was a very interesting and very rewarding experience uh, because it may sound strange to say this, but I think for a lot of correspondents these days, it's quite rare to actually do reporting. Reporting in the sense of going to a place where you don't know exactly what's happened and finding out what has happened. 
so much of what we do these days is, uh, there is great value in it, but it, essentially the job is uh, interpreting and analyzing and presenting information w which is uh, available from elsewhere. I mean, this uh, election yesterday is an example of that. Um, you know, you might, if, you were, if you're conscientious, go down to some of the polling stations and talk to voters coming out. You might go on the campaign trail and listen to what the politicians had to say. But none of us, I think, last night were, were phoning around the, uh, the constituencies, checking the results as they came in. That information is available on the television, on the news agencies, in English as well as Japanese. But in the tsunami zone, um, I, I found myself uh, going to places where I didn't really know what I was going to find. Now, I, I don't think I ever went anywhere where I was the first journalist, but, but often there were not many journalists, and certainly not many uh, journalists in the English language who got there first. So it involved you know, getting up early in the morning, driving um, uh, in difficult conditions. We didn't, we didn't have enough um, fuel. Uh, we didn't know the conditions of the roads. Getting to these places, finding out what had happened, driving back to the hotel and writing it up. Um, and that doesn't happen all that often. Um, and, and as a result of that, I wasn't um, checking my emails on the internet every 15 minutes. Um, and I wasn't, uh, I, of course, I was aware of, of what was going on in Fukushima, um, acutely aware of that, and aware of it as a, a very personal safety issue or potential one for myself and my family who were in Tokyo. Um, but when I got back to Tokyo, um, it was something of a surprise to realize that the, after not very long, after a few days, the international concern about the tsunami, uh, which still was, was large, by and large had been eclipsed by anxiety, acute anxiety, about Fukushima Daiichi. And Perhaps I, I shouldn't have been surprised by that, but, but it seems to me, and still seems to me, that um, that, that is quite a, a, a striking thing. It's easy to be cynical about the media, and no one is more cynical than journalists themselves, if you talk to them privately at least. And a, a, a common articulation of that, of that cynicism is along the lines of, of the phrase, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, we, we know what that means, um, and often it's true that the, the prominence of a new story depends to an extent on the numbers who have died. Um, and I, I think most foreign correspondents have um, found themselves in the situation of having a conversation with their foreign desk, and these are uh, you know, very, they're very sensible, sensitive people. And you're discussing a disaster, a natural disaster, a, a man-made disaster, an act of terror perhaps somewhere in the world, and discussing how much space, if any space, it warrants in the next morning's paper. And, and often the question is, well, how, how many have died? And then you find yourself, usually silently, because it's not often acknowledged, this process, but silently making a calculation, well, have enough people died to make this important? But in the case of the tsunami, there was no question. Um, 19,000 people had died. In the first week or two, the, the numbers, because of the numbers of missing and unaccounted for, it seemed like it could have been much higher, you know, 25,000 at one point. No one so far has died directly as a result of, of what happened in Fukushima. It's, and it's too early to be sure, much too early, but it may be that none ever will. But coverage of Fukushima as a story fairly soon, certainly I think in, in both our papers, uh, overwhelmed the, the story of the tsunami. The tsunami was, was not ignored, of course, but Fukushima internationally was a bigger story. I, I was in Italy um, uh, a couple of weeks ago at a, a, a gathering of, of journalists and um, talking to European journalists and they were asking me about covering this story, and, um, uh, and they talked about Fukushima, um, 
And Fukushima to them was the name for the disaster. Um, and by that, they meant the meltdown of the re nuclear reactors at Fukushima Daiichi and its consequences, but also the, and really as a lesser thing, the tsunami which killed 19,000 people. Um, and there are reasons for this, of course. One of them is that natural disasters, as opposed to man-made ones, are not susceptible to the kind of analysis um, it, which newspapers uh, uh, specialize in, in the same way as, as man-made disasters, because they are random, in some ways meaningless, planetary events. When, when the, the, the plates rub up against one another and, and release that energy under the sea and the wave comes in, no one is to blame for that. Um, you can talk to a certain extent about the, uh, the, the, the human uh, precautions which may or may not have been taken about evacuation plans and heights of sea walls, and then afterwards about the pace of reconstruction. But in the end, Mr. Khan, Mr. Arbe, Mr. Bush, whoever, are not to blame for these natural disasters. The priests, the theologians, may have difficult questions to answer. But if a 40 meter tsunami comes in, anywhere in the world, people are going to die. It's nothing like as rich a field as, for example, the politics of nuclear power. The, that disaster in Fukushima was, of course, set off by the tsunami, but it was a man-made situation, a man-made disaster. And there's a lot more to say about man-made disasters. The other thing, of course, is that in Western Europe and in the eastern seaboard, at least in the United States, we, we don't have big earthquakes. We do have plenty of nuclear power stations uh, in a relatively small area, but, you know, people in... England in Kent or Cumbria can imagine having to flee a nuclear meltdown, but they're never likely to face a tsunami, so it's a lot more personal as a, uh, as a risk. But I, I think that despite this, it was a failure of foreign reporting and a challenge to those of us who are based in Japan how to tell the continuing story of the suffering caused by the tsunami, um, and that's a challenge that, that I've been aware of in my in my work, and, and I am, as Carl mentioned, I'm, I'm working on a book now uh, about the tsunami, and I, I hope my publisher is going to let me get away with this. But as far as possible, I'm I'm going to try and ignore Fukushima Daiichi as a fairly trivial little industrial accident and concentrate on the the, the natural disaster. Um, the the other observation. I have to make is, is about radiation. Um, I think all of us who were living in eastern Japan at that time and many other people around the world who uh, engaged in, in this crisis, uh, diplomats for example, foreign governments, everyone uh, underwent a very drastic education in radiation and its, quali and its qualities. And very quickly, we were all talking sieverts and millisieverts and becquerels. But our ignorance at the beginning was really quite extreme. And I think this was the great contributor to the remarkable panic that seized hold of many people at that time. And this is something in which journalists do not bear the sole responsibility. Um, the, I think the, the, the same um, ignorance and the same mistakes uh, were very observable in some foreign governments and foreign embassies in Tokyo, institutions which you know, have plenty of access to privileged and authoritative sources of information. But perhaps the, the one way I can, I can illustrate this is to tell a, a story of my own. A, a few weeks after the disaster, I think it was the end of March, I uh, began, like others, to look into the possibility of going into the exclusion zone, the 20 kilometer zone, to see what was happening there. Um, I talked to various specialists and experts on, on radiation, including, uh, for example, Greenpeace, who were at the time being uh, 
who as an organization were inclined to play up the, the danger and the dangers of, of radiation. Um, and it became clear uh, from talking to these well-informed people that you could go into the evacuation zone, even be quite close to the plant itself, and as long as you took some basic precautions, as long as you stayed out of long grass and, and forests, um, and didn't stay there for very long, you could go in, have a look, and, and emerge quite safely. I, I remember the um, one, of, one of the moments when I realised this was possible was when, quite early on, I, I learned, and I hadn't learned this, that the white suit that everyone was wearing, which looked so scary and kind of sci-fi, um, the Tyvek suits, as they're called, it, actually, it's just a kind of paper. I, I just assumed they were lined with lead or something, you know, they were like space suits. But they're not. I mean, I've, I've got one, and it's just a kind of paper that doesn't have any gaps in it. Um, it. It's not that bad. You can go in, have a look, come out, and you'll be fine. And, you know, I and other Jones have done that a number of times, and we were fine. So I outlined this plan I had one evening to one of my editors in London. And, and his reaction was, was rather um, incoherent, but, but very strong. He, he thought it was a very bad idea. He couldn't really say why. But he just thought it was a bad idea. Why? Why? Why, why would you do that? Oh, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Anyway, in the end, um, I talked to other people about it. I got the okay to do it. I went in, came out, wrote the story, took the pictures, and it was fine. And the next day, I you know, eagerly looked on in the paper to see my story, and there it was. And alongside it was a story from uh, Libya, uh, where you remember the the war was raging. Uh, the war against G Gaddafi, and we had uh, a uh, very experienced journalist there, a, a war correspondent, um, and his story described had the hair-raising experience of travelling with, with the rebels quite close to the front line, uh, the battle against Gaddafi's troops, and the, um, the, the shooting, uh, the, uh, the unpredictability, the grand missiles coming in, the noise they made, the explosion, diving for cover, escaping, driving out again, you know, in one piece, but clearly having encountered danger. Now, of the two of us, him or me, who is objectively at greater risk of injury or death, it clearly was the war correspondent. But from the point of view of this particular editor who I'd spoken to, his was the acceptable and manageable risk. That's what war correspondents do. They're adept at managing and minimizing risk. And when you work in situations like that, you realize that those moments when death simply comes out of a clear blue sky are very rare. Most of the time, you can work safely in very dangerous places if you think systematically about it and if you have some experience. But for this particular editor, the presence of radiation changed that completely. He couldn't conceive of radiation as a, as a danger that could be managed like, like others. And I think we saw that across the board in the reaction to the Fukushima disaster, which was almost superstitious in its irrationality at times. And I think we in the media played a part in that, although we're not wholly responsible. I don't want to be misunderstood as an apologist for, for nuclear power or a defender of decisions made at Fukushima Daiichi before and after the disaster. I mean, personally speaking, overall, I think that Japan, at least, should not have nuclear power stations. But I often felt myself to be at odds with the conventional wisdom at that, at that time. Radiation is very dangerous, of course. And it's invisible, which is the most frightening thing about it. But it is manageable. I mean, Martin and I have both stood very close to those broken reactors on the various trips that TEPCO have allowed. Uh, and provided you have the right equipment and you don't linger there too long, you will be OK. At the time, of course, uh, no one could foresee the future. They never can. And there was clearly the potential for a wider disaster than the one that had occurred. And it's another discussion, but good luck had, had a part in preventing that. But I, as far as I can see, with the possible exception of one day in Tokyo when the, the, there was a spike in the water levels, a spike in the radiation water levels, 
Tokyo was never threatened with, with health threatening levels of radiation from Fukushima. It didn't happen. But many, many people believed that this was something that was decidedly close and as a result of that belief left Tokyo, left Japan, causing great disruption and distress. They felt as if they were in a place where the metaphorical ground missiles were raining down all around them. And in certain places, um, it, it, all, it all, of course, quickly became very political, um, and discussions of it were very political. But in certain places, panic about radiation in Tokyo seemed almost to be a badge of progressive political beliefs. It was as if it was right on to, to panic or to encourage other people to panic. And I thought that was a lamentable situation. It should be possible to despise TEPCO and to oppose nuclear power, but still to acknowledge that radiation is not a magical curse, uh, but a risk like any other, which can be dealt with well or badly. Um, and we're talking about the role of the media, and I don't believe the media was alone in uh, creating that, that situation. Few institutions cover themselves in glory. And I think, as we're going to hear from Martin, that the Japanese media at times erred in the other direction by too readily <coughs> accepting official reassurances about what was happening. Uh, but I think that we did fail overall, collectively we failed in the duty to scrutinise and question the dominant narrative at the time, which uh, at times was little more than panic, run for your lives. I'll stop there and let Martin talk. <clears throat> thank you, Richard, and I uh, want to say thank you to the organizers and to Kyle uh, for inviting us. Um, I have been awake since about 5 a.m. Sunday morning with the election coverage, so it's still Sunday for me. <laughs> so if I am a little bit incoherent and look like I'm a deer caught in headlights, please forgive me, but I'm still struggling to figure out why my Sunday is so long. <laughs> Without vacation, by the way. Um, and now that we're back to the future of one-party rule, um, a different issue, though. Um, yeah, I mean, I felt the same way as Richard about the praise that Kyle uh, heaped upon us. I don't, I don't know for about five, you know, I, I live up to that, but I will share with you my thoughts. Um, Kyle asked me to speak about the Japanese media, um, and as Richard noted, I, I did write a book about it in Japanese last year. Um, and uh, it's not really an academic book or a, some sort of systematic study of the media, so I don't consider myself a, an expert. Rather, it's just my own impressions as a journalist looking at the Japanese journalists. And it was a book written for Jap a, a Japanese audience, and so it, it was more of kind of just my own observations. And what I'll do today is to start off, uh, I, I, I'm told I have 15 minutes to talk about what I saw uh, up in, uh, mainly in Fukushima, uh, in terms of the Japanese media, and then to draw some broader observations from that. Um, and I'm happy that Richard covered the foreign media, because I, I was up in, not like Richard, I went up the next morning, first thing. I tried to leave. I was in Tokyo when the earthquake happened. I tried to leave on March 11, just couldn't. Just uh, everything was paralyzed. And so I left about 4.30 a.m. on the 12th because I wanted to get out as fast as possible and get up north. Um, and I spent about two months in Tohoku. Uh, I did come back a couple of times for resupplies, but I, I was up there basically until Golden Week. Probably 80% tsunami and 20% nuclear accident. After I came back to Tokyo in May, uh, we switched to kind of the opposite ratio, probably three quarters nuclear and one quarter tsunami. Uh, we made a decision to put our resources into a series of investigative stories about, first about the Khan government and then about TEPCO and other places. Um, and that took, really kind of took the rest of the year in terms of our, the main focus of our coverage. Um, so, you know, especially in those first two months, I really, it was great. I mean, I had no access to the internet. It's wonderful. I mean, I had a satellite phone, an iridium phone. That was my only link to the outside world. 
you know, cell phones didn't work for weeks, you know, uh, nothing. You, you, were, you, were, you were cut off from the internet, and it was like the greatest two weeks, three weeks, until, and then when, when it finally was restored, it was like disappointing. So I would, you know, I, would, I was in Napoli, I actually ran across Richard in Minami Sandiku. I saw this tall man with a satchel walking towards me, and I'm like, I know that dude. Um, and we were like, we were, we were like in the middle of the town, like it was just, it was like Hiroshima in the photos, it just was like this, it was awful, I mean it was like, you know, devastation and some of the pharaoh concrete structures had survived the waves and there was Richard walking towards me and so, um, uh, but I guess uh, let me start with two stories uh, about, that, that, that I hope cast a little bit of light on what I saw with the Japanese media. Um, and the first one is, takes place, or took place in Minami Soma, which as most of you probably know is a city about, it's in that, most of it's in that zone between 20 and 30 kilometers north of the Daiichi, Fukushima Daiichi plant. It has a population of about 70,000 people, um, and uh, I was there in late March, and it was my second time in Fukushima. My first time was on March 13th. I was in Fukushima. Uh, so my second time in Fukushima was, was in late March. I went down to Minami Soma. Uh, and I went down because the mayor of Minami Soma, a fellow named uh, Sakurai, had posted a video on YouTube. And it was like kind of this digital, you know, plea for help, you know, message in the bottle cast out into the digital sea where he's speaking into the camera and it looks really grim and it's dark and he's like, you know, <laughs> help me everyone can open. He's, like, you know, he's like, you know, please send us supplies, send us food, send us water. Because what had happened was the um, Japanese truck drivers were so afraid of radiation that no trucks would drive into Minami Soma. So they were completely cut off. No one would deliver goods into the city. And so he was saying, you know, we have hospitals, we need fuel, we need water, we need food. Um, and I wanted to go see for myself what the situation was. And I arrived down there, I can't remember the day, it was, you know, some, sometime in the late 20s, you know, 27, 28th of March, some, some, somewhere towards the end of March. And as I said, you know, most of the city is in that 20 to 30 kilometer belt, which means it was not evacuated, but it, there was a recommendation at the time to stay indoors. Of the 70,000 residents, about 50,000 had fled, so about 20, the 25,000 were left in the city. Uh, we went to the city hall to find Mr. Sakurai. And I remember walking into the building. I had a photographer with me, and we were driving. And walking into the city hall and saying, you know, I'm a journalist, um, and I want to meet your mayor. And I never forget the reaction, because it was like, ah, Kisha, here comes a reporter, you know. And it was like all this flurry of activity, like, oh, you know, come, come, come. They kind of took me upstairs. And I found myself put in front of Mr. Sakurai like, right away without an appointment, just boom, right in front of him. Um, and if you've ever dealt with mayors in Japanese towns, they're, they're very busy people. I mean, they're you know they, they're they're talking to the head of the co-op or the head of whatever. I mean, but they have they have the little you know constellation of vested interests and they're, they're busy people. You know? So it's not it's very unusual to get put in front of the mayor right away. Um, and. What I, the message I got from him was not surprisingly that they had been abandoned. But what surprised me was he mentioned that they'd also been abandoned by the media. And he took me into the Kisha Club, which as most of you probably know, it's where the sort of this, it's actually a physical, in many cases a physical room where the journalists, the, 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 the local journalists, the Japanese journalists are, are put to, um, where they, they can stay close to the mayor and to the officials in the city hall. And, cut and get all the handouts right away and cover things uh, at close range. And the Kisha Club was empty. It had been abandoned you know, days after the accident. Um, and I just remember the anger that he expressed towards that that, 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 that the journalists all ran away like on March 13th or 14th and never came back. They would, they would talk to him by phone, but they wouldn't come to Minami Soma to see what happened. And it, it struck me really as kind of hard to understand, to be honest, because you had 20, 25,000 people were still there. No evacuation order had been given. Uh, I, I'm just, you know, I don't know, just sort of my instincts are like, if you, if you have 25,000 people there, you should have people there reporting on them. 
you know? I mean, that it, it's just, just seems normal somehow. So it, I, I have to say that I was astounded by that fact and also astounded by Mr. Sakurai's anger at that fact and just was this feeling of abandonment. And I remember talking to a city official who told me, you know, we read in, you know, the Nine Nine Shimbun. And, and by the way, when I talk about the Japanese media, I'm usually talking about the central newspapers um, and NHK. I'm not talking about local papers, and it, it, it's I'm kind of focusing in on on, on the main papers. Um, but we read. They told me that the city official told me that he re he read in the the papers that it's safe. You know that, that the officials are saying, "Don't worry, don't panic, it's safe." And yet these reporters who write that are afraid to come here. So how safe can it be? Are we really are we okay? You know, so asking me like you know, like if I like if I had a clue. Um, I just hoped you were safe because I was there too. But um, but that's sort of that, that that abandonment and that anger. The second story took place not long after in a town or a village called Itape, which as many of you probably know is northeast, I'm sorry, northwest of Minami Soma. It's a village, I can't remember the population, uh, 20,000, 15,000, I can't, I can't remember. I probably have that number wrong. Um, and uh, I went there because there was a controversy over the IAEA, the watchdog agency in Vienna, where, where they're based. And the IAEA had issued a recommendation, as I recall, to evacuate Itape, Itape Mura, because according to Japanese government data, the radiation levels were above the recommended evacuation level of, I believe, is 20 millisieverts per year. And this recommendation was being, had been dismissed and basically was being criticized in the Japanese media, sort of like, you know, you know, sort of the, the flygen sort of argument, you know, the foreigners are criticizing us, you know, and over, overestimating the damage or, or the risk. And so I went to talk to the mayor, and he had the same sort of uh, defiant attitude that, that uh, you know, why is the IAEA picking on Itate Mura? And it was one of those, it was interesting because I, unlike Sakurai-san who met me right away, the, the mayor of Itate wouldn't meet me. So I had to basically camp out in the, in the village hall for several hours until he finally agreed to meet me. Um, and it was bizarre because I sat down with him and it was one of those things like if it, you know, if it happened in a Hollywood movie, you'd be like, oh yeah, right. But it, it really did happen. It, it, a group of IAEA inspectors showed up, and like these three French guys, you know, like in the, these white suits that, that Richard described, and they had like masks. You, you ever see ET? Remember the, when the guys came to claim ET? It was like that, and like it was so bizarre because like they're like going into this parking lot of this like little Japanese village, and so all these farmers like those little pickup trucks, these little little Japanese pickup trucks they have in the rural areas, and they're all kind of sitting there like you know, and the guys come out like in their like, they have like a Geiger counter and they're all like in white with suits and masks and you can't see that they're humans like aliens. And they're kind of measuring the radiation. And I was with the mayor who I believe his name, his name is Kato San, I believe I, I maybe get that wrong it's still on Sunday time. Um, and he like you know somebody came in and said no, he's like and you could just see like Phew. he just like got outraged, he was running outside and I followed him, I ran downstairs. The mayor's office was on the second floor. Ran downstairs, I ran after him to see what was going to go on. He was like, he goes trucking out there, he's like, Kaide, you know, get out of here, go home, you know. And yelling at these, these three bewildered IAEA scientists or, you know, researchers, you know, go, go, get out of here, get out of here. Um, but uh, also in his case, though, it was interesting because after we, he kind of had given this defiant interview of how, you know, these, the IAEA was slandering Itate Mura and how they are going to stay, um, at the very end, he, in a moment of candor, he asked me if I thought it was the right thing to stay. <laughs> you know, I hope I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm responsible for the lives of these people in this village. Um, and I'm sure, as you all know, that uh, eventually Itape Moro was evacuated. Uh, the, 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 the government in Tokyo had to admit that, that there was an issue. Um, and I guess with those two stories first, well, those are the first two times I kind of ran into issues of the media where 
And I, and I guess in the case of Itate, it had to do really with his, the mayor's decisions, it's sort of this defiant decision to stay being driven by the, 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 the media narrative and the Japanese major newspapers. Um, but it's the first time I, I, I ran into something that I think later on became quite noticeable, and this was a distrust in the media, a kind of a this sort of upwelling of you know, basically betrayal and, and a feeling that the media had, um, you know, wasn't wasn't serving its readers; it was acting on behalf of officialdom. Um, you know, it wasn't the watchdog on power, but the watchdog for power, if you will. Uh, and, and this feeling that uh, that somehow the, that the regular people felt betrayed by it, and, and, and that there was this feeling, this spreading feeling that that, that you couldn't trust the media, you couldn't believe them. Um, and I think that was one of the defining sort of changes after the March 11 accident, in particular the Fukushima part of that accident or disaster, and the Fukushima part of that disaster. That. Um, yeah, I think if you look at kind of the bigger consequences for that was that distrust, which did not was not limited only to the media, but I think extended to the bureaucracy and to the DPJ, as we saw last night. Um, and that was one of the reasons that that prompted me to write a book about it, because I just thought that was so remarkable. You know, I, I've I've lived in Japan off and on since 1988, and my feeling had always been that. that you know, your average Japanese is a fairly naive consumer of media. But, you know, you go to the U.S. and you have Noam Chomsky and all this kind of you know, and, and discourse theory and narratives and all. You know, people talk about this stuff, right? You talk about it in college. And in Japan, it seemed to be fairly naive. Like people, people don't talk that way. They don't really sort of. They're only really aware of like how television could shape fads and things. But after Fukushima, that was changed. Like there was suddenly a very high level of social awareness of what the media was doing, what they were saying, how they did things. Um, and I think it had many ramifications, one of which I think was the, um, the turning to social media, people, people going to the internet and to Twitter and to websites and whatnot for alternative sources of information. Um, you saw it in the proliferation of NGOs in Fukushima itself in particular. Um, people kind of sharing information directly, kind of alternative networks for information. Um, and you saw it in anger at the media. I remember I went to a protest, a weekly protest in front of the Prime Minister's office. Uh, and then there was that big one last summer, 100,000 people, whatever. And I remember a friend of mine from, uh, I think it was uh, Hotel Station, uh, the, the TV Asahi. And he had, you know, camera crew with him it was like a group of three. And when he sort of stepped out into the crowd, you know, Japan's a very civilized place and people don't sort of insult you in public. But they were going after him. You know, was, he was getting cat calls and like, you know, baka. <laughs> people were they were angry at you know, they saw the camera and boom, they were angry at him. And I was told that NHK didn't even venture to go there because they knew what reception they would get, which maybe explains why NHK never reported on those protests. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, if, if you look at like the defining sort of event or episode in that distrust, right, I think it was the, you know, it was known as Speedy. And for those of you, who, most of you probably know what Speedy is, but for those who don't, briefly, it's a computer pr system that was built in the 1980s, I think, at a cost of something like $140 million that was meant to predict where the plume of radiation would spread after a nuclear accident. And the system was not used, or it was, it was not disclosed, the information that the system made available was not disclosed, was not used in any sort of way. Um, you know, initially there were some reports, and or I think the first map was released on like March 23rd, the first speedy map. And this was too late to be helpful, right? I mean, speedy would have been useful in the first couple of days, you know, if you release it two weeks later, it's already too late. It's supposed to predict where the radiation goes, and by March 23rd, the radiation had already gone. Um, and the Yomi Shimbun, uh, I think, had the first report that I saw on Speedy basically saying that it was useless and then it wasn't helpful, you know, kind of giving the, the official line at the time that Speedy was not useful. Um, and 
you know, I, 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 you know, I think um, later on the perception of speedy began to change. And where I first noticed it was I was getting that line of speedy not being useful, like when I was recording in Tokyo, like in May and June. And then I would go to Fukushima, and you get the exact opposite line. Like I spoke to uh, Baba San, who's the mayor of Namie. Namie is a town right above Baba, I mean, right, right above the Fukushima Daiichi plant. And the, when the re evacuation order was issued right after the accident to the town of Namie, the residents, you know, natives of Fukushima, they knew that the winds in the wintertime tended to blow from north to south you know, in a southerly direction, and so they, they fled to the north thinking it was safe. But it turned out they fled right into the plume. And so, and when they learned that there was a way to predict where that plume was going, and that they hadn't been told that, the anger, I mean, you had the mayor of Namie in, no, I, we spoke to him like in July, I guess, <coughs> calling it murder. He, he used the word murder, it's such a jinsai. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, the anger and, and the clarity of the anger. Yet, if you read any of the major newspapers, you would have no idea that that anger existed. You know, I mean, the mayor was out there calling the national government murderers, and yet you could read any of the big papers and then not find a peep about that. Um, I mean, and really, you don't get, you didn't get critical discussion of Speedy and the decisions not to disclose Speedy until I think the Mainichi Shimbun had the first lengthy discussion in Japanese in uh, mid to late August. The Asahi Shimbun didn't really get into it until October when they began a really very excellent series, the, the Promethean Trap, I guess, Purometeas um, Nawana. And so it really wasn't until about a half year later that people began to sort of figure out that there was this issue with speed. Um, and then I'm running out of time, so I guess the final thing I'd say, the other reason I wrote about the distrust, and the, I found the distrust in the media in Japan remarkable, was it gave me a sense of deja vu. Um, the same thing happened in the U.S. after not 3.11, but 9.11, and in particular the run-up to the war in Iraq. Um, you know, you saw the same sort of failures in the American media and, and the New York Times that you saw in the Japanese media, which was, you know, to kind of turn off your critical faculties, to favor official sources, um, and it was like, you know, a period of national crisis. There was this urge to rally around the nation. Um, the result was an over-dependence on official accounts of things. Um, you know, again, sort of the, the suspension of the faculties of disbelief. Um, you know, we were told about all the WMIs, the weapons of mass destruction that Iraq had, and, and, and these were dutifully reported. And of course, it all ended up being a bunch of bollocks. Um, and, you know, if Speedy was the defining episode in Japan, then the Judith Miller, which may, folks remember, remember that, I don't know how young you guys are. The Judith Miller episode would have been the defining, a similar moment in, in the United States, and Judith Miller was a New York Times reporter who uh, basically was regurgitating information from the Bush administration without bothering to use her brain. Um, and so the, the result was the same. You had the same distrust where the media had failed the readers, they had failed the people, they had favored officialdom over readers. And, and I'm gonna end here, because I, you know, I can go on much longer, but with the observation that, what's it now, 2013, that would have been like 2002. So 11 years later, that distrust is still prevalent against the Times and other, New York Times and other American media. So, I mean, once you lose that trust, it's hard to regain, and it takes a long time to regain. And I think the same is probably here. It's going to take a long time before people would trust uh, the Asahi or the Yomudi or these other papers again. Thank you. Questions? Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm an intern with uh, ICAST. Um, so this is sort of a question for both of you, but obviously as you know, international journalists, you're sort of the lens that directs international attention to issues on Japan, because you know, abroad we can't be here, we can't see what's happening. Obviously the primary like, objective should be literally like, factual reporting, telling us what's going on during a crisis, but there's obviously 
also a component where you're not neutral sources and you have to find this balance between bringing attention to like you know the plight of tsunami victims versus bringing attention to like nuclear issues that are probably you know as you said more relevant to um, you know the U.S. or like European audiences and like how more generally when you're writing articles do you decide on like balances between like drawing attention to people here in Japan versus raising issues that are relevant to people abroad like what as you're like writing an article what is the process where you decide oh this is what I need to highlight and focus on in this article well, you mentioned factual versus interpretation um, and it's interesting because I think what the internet has done with my work, as I discovered yesterday, is kind of do both, you get schizophrenic. I uh, wrote probably four stories yesterday about the same thing. And I had to do that because we have the internet, which wants, you know, it, it wants immediate love. It wants, you know, it's, it's met, it need, its needs met right away. And not only do you have to feed the internet right away, but then you have to keep refeeding it because, you know, the story's not there for three hours, it's getting old, we need a new version. <laughs> So it's like this sort of, you know, it's like writing for people with, with minute attention spans. So I had to do multiple versions of the story while I was also then doing the interpretive version, which was the way it works in my paper is we'll do like, that's a, the election's a good example. The results came like 8, 8.15, somewhere in there. So I had a story, it took a little bit of time to get through the editing process, but it, it, it was up within, you know, like an hour of that. Um, and I probably updated it twice before the final results came at 2.30 a.m. While I was doing that, I was writing a lot much longer interpretive story for the newspaper itself, the physical paper, um, which is now also online. And that was, and that's usually what happens, is you have that kind of a, kind of a spot news, uh, maybe a news story, a factual story, and then you're also working on an interpretive story. So you're, you kind of do the jobs of both an AP wire service reporter and a Time magazine journals back in the old days, the weekly magazine, and you're doing both of those jobs and the same day. Um, and so you're really trying to do both, I guess, is my answer. Is, is, uh, and the reason why you do the interpretive is because you have to explain to people why it matters to them, you know, what's what's important about it all. You, you need to, you know, if, if, if Japan, if the LDP wins in Japan, I mean, for, for people who watch Japan and know Japan, fine, it can make sense, but, you know, 99.9% .9 of my readers don't pay much attention to Japan. So I need to explain to them why it matters, you know, what's important about it. So that's one of the big tasks that we face, or I, I face, is to tr try to present what's happening here, but to present, present it in a way that people can understand and that it, 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 to them it makes sense, but also it's why it's important to them. Um, if people want to know something that, if you, if you think about like, you know, why would you read a story about like Zimbabwe? You know, or why would you read a story about Lithuania? You know, I mean, you have to be something that kind of grabbed you, that had some interest to you, that resonated with you somehow. And that's what you're trying to find with, with events in Japan to, to get as many people to, to really sort of pay attention to, as you can. Um, so that's, that's my short answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, my experience is the same. I mean, the, the Interpretation is, is more and more important because the, the you know the the essential facts are um, available immediately from multiple sources now. Um, you don't need to go to the Times or the New York Times; it'll be on the BBC website far quicker than we can get it up. So, making sense of it, um, interpreting it, presenting it in a way palatable to your particular audience is important, and, and people often. Um, I think people, non-journalists, sometimes assume or think there's a, um, there's a kind of formula um, according to which these decisions are made. But they're made really very, in a much more haphazard and, and instinctive way. Um, I mean, the, that applies, I think, both to the process of, of, of composing the article that appears in the newspaper or goes up online. Um, it just sort of comes out. I mean, I don't... Um, begin by calculating the percentage of space I'm going to give over to, an, uh, to analysis as opposed to facts. It, you know, it, it, it happens naturally. And similarly with the, um, the stage before that, when um, 
the, the conversation that, that happens with editors in London. It's not really that I decide or that they decide, but we have a, a conversation. And over the course of a few hours, as the shape of the next day's paper becomes clear, the decision emerges. And it depends on external factors, like the number of pages in the paper, and that depends on the number of advertisements that have been sold, and also on the number of, um, also on the events elsewhere in the world. I mean, as you, um, as I'm sure you, you all know, um, Britain is expecting a royal baby. <laughs> now, no doubt, like me, you can hardly sustain bladder control. Um, but let me tell you that if there was a uh, if there was a mega tsunami in um, in Japan today, it would be far less of a big story in tomorrow's paper because of the competing world news. I'd say one more thing. But you made an interesting point. There is also um, there's a lot of pressure. I I mentioned like we do the EPN, the Time Magazine the same time in the same day. But there's a, there's a business pressure there too because there's something we call commodity news, which are like the, the stories that give just the facts and they appear in MSN and Yahoo and wherever and you don't even know half the time where they come from, right? And we need to, to get people to come to our website, we need to offer something different. It has to be a value added. And so there's a, there, I found that there's a growing emphasis on the interpretation a growing emphasis on what we used to call a second day story, which is like, okay, the first day story would be the news, and the second day story is the interpretation. Now we do the second day story at the same time as we do the first day story. Sometimes you have to do the second day story the day before. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Wall Street Journal method. Um, but it's true, because you're, you're trying to attract readers by being by going beyond just the facts, because that's any, you know, that's, that's available in mass form, really, with, with, with you, know, you want something that's more unique, more your own, more value added, that gets people to come to your website. So there's also kind of a, the internet has changed for thinking about news and how you present news. Uh, just, you know, the urge to get more people, get more eyeballs or clicks on your website has changed the way we do our business. Uh, my name is David. Thank you very much for your uh, presentations. I have a, a little, um, uh, related to the first question, much of my work is uh, right now ethnographic. It's uh, collecting oral narratives in Tohoku, um, and we've been working on this for a while. The first thing that everybody wants to find out is, you're not media, are you? Um, and it's not necessarily so much that media is connected to the state or uh, is intentionally or systematically uh, misrepresenting, but it's that they don't care. Uh, one woman said, every time, uh, this was actually in Minami every time there's a suicide, we have a, 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 somebody from the media comes, but nobody wants to know why they committed suicide. No one wants to know what the conditions are here. Um, it got to be uh, later on that even that NHK crew with uh, a camera and everything else couldn't get anyone to talk to them. Um, everyone would just kind of ignore them and, and, and walk away. Um, my question is, I wonder, is there, uh, as, as foreign journalists, do you feel uh, an obligation uh, to the local people as well as to your intended audience? And is there a mechanism within your, uh, both within your immediate uh, reporting, but also within the newspaper, that allows you to figure out what kind of credibility or the challenges of, of credibility to the, to the very local people who are probably not reading your papers? Uh, and, and might not even care uh, what it is that is being written. Um, but is that a concern? And if so, how does it manifest itself? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, the, the, the fact is that um, no one ever goes up to a place like uh, Tobaku after the tsunami just to have a look, just for fun. Actually, that's not true. Some people are now. They go, there's quite a lot of um, disaster tourism. But putting that, putting that to one side, the, the reason we as journalists go up there is, uh, is to do our jobs and to, and to report the news. We're, we're not there principally to help the local people. That's true of, of you as, as academics as well. Uh, you, would, you wouldn't get your funding just to go up and have a look and maybe or maybe not come back with something. We go there with a, a professional purpose in mind. 
there's nothing to be ashamed of in, of in that. Um, having said that, um, you can go about your professional work um, and comport yourself with good manners or with bad manners. And not all journalists have the best manners. And being up against a deadline in particular does wonders for your bad manners. Um, I've, my, my experience in, in Tohoku has, has always been very good. Um, I, I think British journalists probably are, are um, less sensitive than others because um, we're used to being treated as the scum of the earth back then. Uh, and a lot of us are. Um, co compared to, to the, uh, the way the British treat the press, uh, Japanese people and people in Tohoku especially were extremely charming, welcoming, um, sometimes breathtakingly um, generous given the cruel circumstances many of them found themselves in. Um, but you do have to be sensitive. Um, and, and if you're sensitive, the people will respond to that. I, I mean, a lot of it, and I, I think this is, is one of the, the things you're getting at, a lot of it has to do with the amount of time you put in. Um, and, and it comes down to deadlines. Sometimes you just have to go into a place and find out very quickly what's going on. There might be situations where it's a matter of minutes. Um, that that it is it's hard. That that's when um, people take offence. Um, I, I mean, whenever possible, I, I try to put as much time in as I can. And when you do, um, people, especially Japanese people. Uh, are very gracious. Uh, I mean, I've been going up to uh, a community in um, near Ishinomaki for the purposes of the book I'm writing. It's, um, some of you may have heard of it. It's the, um, the, the story I'm writing is about the, the Okawa Elementary School, uh, which is really the only, it was the only place where this happened. There was a, um, an elementary school where um, there, there wasn't an evacuation. Um, there could have been easily in an evacuation, and almost all the children in the school died. Um, you know, it's a, a, a rural area. Everyone knows one another. Everyone knows somebody's lost. If not all, then one or two of their kids. Uh, it's an extremely distressing place. The emotions are very raw, and one hesitates to to go in their feet first, asking those questions of people who've lost everything. Um, but if you go about it the, the right way, uh, sensitively, then people do respond. And I think that's, that, that's all there is to it. It's a matter of um, doing it well or badly. Um, Richard gave such an eloquent answer. I don't know what I can really add to that. Um, <clears throat> one thing I did notice, that there was a tendency in Tohoku, in the tsunami zones, for media scrum to form. You know, like, like all the TV stations will go to the same, tend to be Iku uh, Takata got a lot of attention. Minami Sani, who got attention, and, and, and you would find right away that people would get callous and sort of turned off pretty quickly. And so my solution to that was to try to find the communities that were being ignored by local media. Um, one place I spent time was Otsuchi, which is in Iwate, about midway between Miyako and Iku um, Takata. And it was a town that was basically ignored by the media for quite a long time. And I remember the, the, the deputy mayor, the, the mayor was killed in the, the wave, but the deputy mayor at one point was asking me, how can we get more media attention? You know, how come everyone goes to Dikas and Takata and doesn't come here? Yeah. Um, but that sort of saturation and the scrum, and especially at TV journalism, the, the demands are very, you know, they, they want like on the camera and kind of some short emotional comment, um, you know, I, I think people get turned off by that pretty quickly. Um, you know, in terms of obligation to the local folks, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, what, I don't have to say beyond what Richard said, but um, you often find, like, I find myself in a position where you would be talking to people who had suffered great loss, and you were in a position where you're kind of, from a very micro level of one or two families lost, talking to the world. and, and, and the stage you're kind of skipping was like the official Japanese government stage. You was, you're going to find very micro, very macro, um, which was sort of, it, it, it was an interesting sort of situation. But um, you know how to be sensitive to that. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, 
there are different, you know, what's, what's the word? You know, there are good journalists and bad journalists, just as there are good academics and bad academics, or good lawyers and bad lawyers. And yes, there are good lawyers. Um, you know, and so it depends on the person. I don't know. I mean, it depends how you see your job and how you do it. And if, you know, as Richard said, you know, I found in Tohoku that people had suffered great loss with a lot of dignity. Um, and if you showed that you cared and were trying hard and were sensitive to them, they would open up to you. Um, and even the ones who have been made callous by, you know, the TV scrum, uh, if you sort of show that, you know, you're not after sort of the quick soundbite on a camera, that they would open up to you too. Um, now, what mechanism do you have, like, for feedback from them? Probably very little. I mean, our main mechanism for feedback these days tends to be the internet. People clicking the reader response button. Um, I don't know how to get a, a real sort of structural, you know, like a mechanism for feedback. For you, you know, you have to literally probably leave staff in these regions, and we aren't staffed to the extent that we can do that. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, there really isn't a mechanism for feedback for people from places like that because unless they they contact us and say, hey, your story about you know my town sucked or whatever. You I mean, you don't really, you know, unless you, unless you get that kind of thing, you don't really get any, you know, they, they have to to reach out to you. But the, but the interesting about the, the interesting thing about the internet is it does make that pop much easier than it was before, before you had to write a letter to the editor, you know, and now you can click on the button and just like, you know, say something. Um, <coughs> so it has been, it is actually easier now with the internet to get feedback from people, but at the same time, you know, people in these towns and the coast really, you know, they're not, most of them aren't online. <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's not like they're kind of on their smartphones all the time. So, yeah, there, I don't think it really is a mechanism for getting feedback from them. Hi, I'm Nancy Snow, and I'm an Abe fellow, not Shinzo Abe, but uh, <laughs> at Keio University, and I remember, uh, I think the day before March 11th, 2011, I received my letter of congratulations that I had a Fulbright to Japan. And I can recall my colleagues uh, telling me, isn't a shame, I won't be able to go now. Because the US media coverage really focused a lot on radiation and the inability to find food and proper water and drink and so on. So. Um, Shifting forward now in my Abe work, I'm doing a book on Japan's image in the world since 311. And I'm curious if you all could give kind of a perspective where we are now in July 2013. I mean, there's a certain image that Japan had in the immediate aftermath of uh, being a victim, and there was great global sympathy but it seems like it's shifted a bit now to, to worry in the world about some of the regional tensions, the um, maybe some of these hate speech demonstrations that have really propagated around the internet. And so I, I was curious about that, and also just whether or not there's been a public awakening vis-a-vis -vis this distrust in institutional media. With our turning to the internet, is that empowering? people, do you think? And um, I can't help but mention Judith Miller. You said she had stopped using her brain. Didn't she go on to Fox News Channel? Or am I, am I, okay. <laughs> I, I can tell you. I, 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 in my career as a journalist, I met a Fox News reporter once in my life. And the first thing he said was, I'm sorry. Um, Japan's image in the world. I mean, I, you know, the, the stories that get the most attention that, that I do now. Um, I mean, the Fukushima story, the kind of the ongoing difficulties at the plant, can't they get it under control? Like the Keystone Cops thing about the rat, and the, you know, I mean, it just this kind of in a, kind of techos bungling, if you will. And it is a major story. And, and it has a real meaning to it. To me, to me, the meaning I've attached to it is that they've let the same people that created the disaster run the cleanup. And, you know, the, the, the nuclear village is still in charge. And that's been my sort of take on it. And so, you know, the image that I've created there is, 
vested interests, you know, there was this chance for Japan to shake out of the vested interests and they didn't do it, and so the vested interests are still there. Uh, the Sengaku dispute is another big story, obviously. I mean, I mean anything for China in it sells. It's like snake oil. You know, if you want, if you, want to, you want to get the story, page one, put China somewhere up high. And when I, when I was at AP, I used to work with the Associated Press, we were told that the two surefire ways to get your story, get attention for your story, put dogs in the lead or pets, or put children in the lead, and you're guaranteed to get attention. Now it's put China in the lead. Um, Chinese dogs are uh, <laughs> with children. But um, the one child. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the narrative of the same copies, though, is really how do we deal with China? It's really, that's more of a China-driven narrative. That's not, if, if there is a Japan-driven narrative, it's either the remarkable patience that the Japanese have shown in not responding to all these Chinese ships. You know, they're usually not responding to all these Chinese ships that could keep going into the, the waters that they claim, or it's, um, uh, you know, will kind of, I see economics in many ways as a response to China, that, that, that there is this willpower now to do something different. I mean, if you hear Abe speak, he says that, you know, this is our last chance to, to really to, to stand up to China. I mean, I mean he says as much. Um, and so, kind of, how does China's rise create anxiety in Asia's former power, you know, our dominant power, right, Japan, which, of course, was dominant for a century. Um, other narratives, I mean, but Japan's image, Japan has a very positive image, I think, in general, readers, I mean, I mean, you get kind of like the, the angry, the anger over the war, especially from Korean and Chinese readers, this is the, the benefit of the internet is I get these messages, and I, for every one angry Japanese right-winger message I get, I get about 10 angry Korean right-winger messages and as many Chinese, so, the, the Korean and Chinese readers are far more proficient in English. Um, I think is the reason, so I don't, I don't know. But, but, it, but it's funny, because I sometimes I get called Hanichi and anti-Japanese because I wrote something critical. And I'm like, man, you know, for every one Hanichi, I get like 10 Koreans telling me I'm pro-Japanese. So it, it's, but it's funny, but, 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 but just in general, that sort of part aside, just like your average American reader is probably pretty positive on Japan. Um, it has a you know, civilized country with great pop culture and anime and food and, you know, I mean, it has a very nice image. I don't, I don't think, I think Japan has, you know, bad, bad power companies, you know, it's seen as having, you know, uh, bad right-wingers. I mean, there are, but, but basically it's, it has a pretty good image, so, um, you know, the, 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 the victimhood after 9, uh, 311, you know, that, that's any sort of coverage of a disaster fades after time. You can't keep coming back to it. But, but that, I think, at least in my coverage, I have to confess, I haven't really seen what the other foreign media wrote about Fukushima. I mean, I, I was in Tokyo for two months, so I have no idea what people were saying. But I, I did see CNN come at one point to Natori, and people said, what's well, Anderson Cooper? And, and, and to me, that was like, okay, time to go. <laughs> when CNN shows up, the story's over. Um, so, you know, I, uh, otherwise, I really don't know what people are saying. But, but, but I know that in my own coverage and in my, the reader reactions I got, the dignity and the strength of the people in Tohoku, that, that really struck a chord you know, with, with readers. And I got amazing reactions from stories like that. Yeah, I agree with Martin. I think when you're um, when you ask questions about Japan's image, uh, the question you have to answer first is Japan's image with whom. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about the kind of people who are in this room, we can uh, you know have a very nuanced conversation about, as you said, hate speech recently. Are there what he, effect has that had? But if you're talking about you know the, the average reader of, of, of my paper back, back in Britain. Um, and no, I mean, things like the, the hate speech um, issue, I mean, I have touched on that in my stories, but I don't think that even registers. I would say since the um, disaster, you know, the, the trajectory has probably been, uh, you know, great sympathy, sympathy after the disaster, as Martin says, admiration for the, um, the stoicism, as it was called, um, alarm about, about Fukushima and about the, um, 
uh, you know, the, the apparent um, uh, inability of the, of the authorities to deal with it. Um, it, well, what people want to know now, when I was back in Europe a couple of weeks ago, is, is, is what's happening. Um, you know, have the places been rebuilt? Is the plant under control? Um, that recently, the, the conflict with China, as Martin says, I think, on balance, people, uh, the, the Senkaku dispute um, and the relationship with China, I think, is not well understood by you know, the average reader of a broadsheet newspaper. But I think overall there is sympathy with Japan rather than China over that. Um, you, the, the other part of your question was about um, distrust of institutional media and, um, and social media, and that's a, a very different question, but I think an interesting one. Um, my feeling about this overall is that the, the um, although social media is very interesting, and the way that they disseminate information is very new. Um, if anything, I think in the long run, it, it's not going to erode the importance of, of um, so-called traditional media. If anything, it's going to reinforce it. Because all these tweets, all these links on Facebook are to the traditional media. Um, there's really very little uh, coming through these channels, which is new in the sense of information being reported by an original source and, and propagated there and nowhere, nowhere else. The conversations that are going on in those channels, all of them in the end come back to the traditional media. And, and there isn't going to be a time when you can manage without professional journalists who spend all their working days thinking about the news, how to report it and how to present it and being funded reasonably well to do that. Without that, the people on Twitter would have nothing to talk about. Um, I'm Tag Murphy from the um, Tokyo campus of the University of Tsukuba. Um, this question is primarily for Martin, but I'd also be interested in uh, Richard's opinion. Um, do you encounter among Japanese journalists for the quality press um, a sense of shame over the betrayal of what uh, journalism should be comparable to that that you expressed over the failure of the American media um, in the build-up to the Iraqi invasion? I mean, the 311 is not the first time that the quality press in Japan has essentially acted as stenographers for Nagata Cho rather than journalists. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I. I wrote a book last year in Japanese about that. It sold 90,000 copies, and I was told that 88,000 of those were Japanese journals. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but, but really, I mean, I, my, the biggest, I, I, when I, the book first came out, I was afraid I was going to get slammed in the Japanese press, that they were all going to hate me because I was, you know, the, the bashing them or whatever. And in fact, the opposite happened. Uh, you know, this, the, whole, the whole kind of gaiatsu phenomenon. <laughs> you know, I can say what they wanted to say, but can't say. And so, like, especially younger reporters, and by younger, I mean Japan, anybody over under 60 is young. <laughs> you know, they, they, um, they really, you know, uh, I've been invited to all sorts of discussions with Japanese journalists. They don't hate me. Um, and, and plus, in the book, I'm not saying that they are bad. I'm just, I'm, it's really more about structural issues. It's not saying that people are bad. Um, but I find that they're very aware, and there's a lot of discontent. And at the worst times, there was a sense of crisis, like, because, because this distrust came at the same time as the internet was hitting them. And the internet is hitting them about 10 years behind, the, you know, it, it hit us. They're, the Asahi right now is, you can, you can feel the panic. Readership is down. They've been outsourcing all their non-essential functions, which is why they can't be too critical of their coverage of Hakin Shine, because <laughs> basically that same sort of like plantation system, the two-tier system exists within their building. Um, but you can really see it because this, these are these are these are um, organizations that really were kind of at the center of the 1955 system. You know, you know the average na uh, national level annual salary at the Asahi Shinjin is? It's, it's about 20 million yen. Average. Now, the New York Times, I can state for a fact, is probably about half that <laughs> at best. So, 
I mean, it really is remarkable how this really, you know, this, this is one of the last big vested interests in the 1955 system that hasn't really gone through the whole, you know, destruction of the convoy system and what happened to more industries that have to compete. Um, they're still protected to a large degree behind the wall of the Japanese language. But at the same time, the internet is eating into their readership base quite to, quite to a large degree. Um, and they're afraid. I mean, you, you can feel it. And it matters to them, do readers like them or do readers want to read them? Do they have customers? You know, it matters. So, and, and so the Asahi in particular, I think, has, you know, I, I sometimes poke fun at them, but I've been an Asahi reader since 1988. And they've been, you know, you can see, you can see the efforts they're making, the Prometheus, the Prometheus no one series is, is excellent. It's now in its fourth book, but it's a daily sort of account of what happened up in Fukushima uh, and elsewhere, but, but kind of a very sort of microscopic, almost an ethnographic sort of look at what of, of these events. Um, and you can see the paper in general has shifted more to a feature to enterprise driven, um, not, not to be so, so much just reacting to the Keisha Club handouts, but actually trying to do something original. So you, you do see them trying. Um, but I think that they're just starting on that process in the same process that hit us a decade ago. I mean, the New York Times, we were told a year ago by Jill um, Abramson, our Uber boss, the managing editor, that we're no longer a newspaper, we're now a website. Um, I mean, things have really changed, um, and, and that's just starting in Japan. So, and so I think the book, and kind of my criticisms actually, I think people are like, you know, yeah, you know, say it, say it, because they want to say it, but they can't say it. I, I don't really have anything to add to that, except to say that, um, you know, I um, uh, chat with and, and talk to Japanese journalists a lot, and um, they, the, the thing they most like talking about is, how rotten the Japanese media is and how <laughs> awful their, their, their editors are. And, um, and, and this is, well, as you said, the young are, are under 60, but uh, it's the sort of senior young as well as the junior young um, who will, will agree on this. Uh, but the, yeah, nothing changes. And um, it strikes me there's a, there's a parallel there with, with Japanese politics. Um, you know, Japanese people complain about their politics quite a lot but don't always seem to take responsibility for their own politicians. Well, hello, my name is Althea and I'm from China. And um, there have been several earthquakes happens in China recently and in Chinese media, um, Ch Chinese people are quite disappointed with Chinese media because they when they are reporting, they report from a personal angle and report too much one hearting story. So when Chinese media scholars look at Japanese media, when reporting March 11, they say like Japanese um, media are more professional in term of, terms of like ways of reporting. They report um, more on like bigger issues or on um, government solutions or kind of that. So. But I also heard Japanese journalist friends, they told me they think Japanese media, um, they also report too much Kizuna Shinbun. So I was just wondering, what's your, uh, what's your view on such kind of human interest story in disaster reporting? Do you think they carry significance or too sensational or irrelevant? And how do you think Japanese media doing such kind of report? I think that you know, the human interest is very important because you need to humanize a story because the story is about humans after all. And, and the place where I really kind of ran into that was we got a lot of criticism early on for showing photos of dead people, the corpses up in these cities, uh, on the, you know, the, the tsunami zone. And that's when I realized that, that the local media was sh were showing no images of corpses. If you read the you know, you, you would see these news accounts on TV or in newspapers, and you'd see these disaster zones, and there's no one dead. You know, and so you actually come away with, oh, you know, they kind of cleaned up the place, you know. You, you didn't really get a sense of, like, that this was actually a disaster zone. And if you went there, and you, know, you saw, it, it was like, you know, it, it was like, what, it must be like after a bombing, there, there were bodies 
dead people. I mean, and I, I wrote about them in my stories to, you know, not, 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 you know, morbid sort of way, but mention them. Um, but, but, but I bring that up because you really got to humanize a disaster. You, you, you can get to, you can, you can kind of get to a high level of view and, 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 and kind of lose sight of the people who are the main victims of it. At the same time, you can also sensationalize their stories. So you've got to kind of strike a balance, right? So I wouldn't say that the human interest story is bad. I would say it's bad if it's, if it's just sort of sensationalizing and tear-jerking and doesn't really kind of go beyond that. But as Richard said with the tsunami, it's kind of hard really to draw big political points from that because it's a random event. It's Mother Nature. You know, I mean, who, you know, it's, it, it, you, you can, you know, what can you say about it, really? You know, in the case of the Ogawa Shogako, the elementary <coughs> school, you know, that was a tragedy because they hadn't practiced what to do in the disaster and the teachers, I mean, I mean he's going to know this far more than I, I do. But my impression from when I went there was the teachers weren't prepared for it somehow, and I mean, the teachers are dead too, so we can't talk to them, right, I think. But, but they, they sat around in the yard for a while. But beyond something like that, you really just, it's hard to sort of, what do you, what, what's the bigger point to make? And so a lot of the coverage does tend to end up with the, with the, the suffering and the tragedy. But I would, I would say you can't not have that because that really is what it is in the end of the day. At the end of the day, it's human suffering, and that's what you want to show. Um, you know, I, I, you, you can write critically about the response by the government, but the Japan's response to the tsunami on the whole was quite good, I thought. And the coverage of the tsunami, like in the major papers, I thought was quite good. I, I don't have a whole lot of criticism of the tsunami coverage, at least in the papers. Um, you know, the Fukushima was much different because there really is, as Richard said, a man-made disaster. Um, but I, I think that humanizing is important because also humans empathize with humans, right? And your readers are also humans, right? So you want them to, you're really successful if you can take somebody like in a place like Ulstji and make somebody like in a place like Iowa care about that person. You know what I mean? If you can make that connection somehow as a writer, I think that's, that's, that's important because it shows, not, not, not in a sensational like, you know, ooh, let's cry, but like in a real sort of way, like, you know, what would you do if you were in their position? You, know, you, can, you can create a real empathy there, and that, and that really requires focusing on the people. So I, th I, don't, I think focusing on the people is important because that's, like in financial journalism, you focus on the money, or, you know, you're, you're always told to follow the money. But it's, like, it's, like, it's a good rule of thumb for politics as well. But for something like this, it really is about people. It's not about wave walls or roads or, you know, big numbers. It's really about these people. So. <laughs> Gerhard Hilscher, freelance from Germany. I would like to ask a question of Richard, or also of Martin, if you're willing to uh, answer, uh, about uh, the, shall we say, political response to the nuclear part of the Fukushima element. Uh, you will remember that when uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Khan flew up there, he made a statement afterwards saying, well, we'll have to uh, develop uh, renewable energies to the degree that we can afford to get out of uh, the nuclear thing, which is too risky, etc. He's been on, uh, that's actually, is from my point of view, the only long-term solution to the nuclear part of the problem. The question is, of course, he was, uh, because so much of his own party was involved in the nuclear uh, village in the, uh, that uh, he was in the end forced out out of the, out of his, the party leadership or he resigned because they wouldn't support him and uh, so my question is wouldn't it be a interesting back uh, uh, back to the future uh, sort of movement to try and encourage Mr. Khan to either uh, fight for leadership of the Minshuto, the Democratic Party of Japan, or for a new anti-nuclear party because uh, they are all such small groups at the moment and no serious uh, effort and no basic policy behind it so far. So I thought Khan is one of the very few possible candidates with the political concept how to go about these problems, would you support that? And could we possibly have also your enthusiasm to have him come 
again through the Foreign Correspondence Club and speak about such purposes. And somebody talks with him before that because to start some sort of political movement on that issue. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I used to be very impressed by Mr. Khan. When soon after I arrived in Japan in the mid 90s, um, Mr. Khan came to prominence when he was health minister dealing with the, um, the issue of the HIV infected haemophiliacs. And uh, he seemed like a very promising and um, uh, sincere politician. My view of him has changed quite a lot since then. <laughs> um, however, if he was to if he did seek to you know, return to meaningful political power, I think being leader of Minstor would be the last thing he would want to be. Um, there doesn't really seem to be much left of that party after yesterday. But the, the serious question, uh, and it is serious, is um, you know what what's happened to the whoops, to to the, the this what seemed that very powerful anti-nuclear sentiment in politics, in party politics. It didn't really feature in this election yesterday. Last summer, as Martin mentioned, there were large numbers of people, not quite as large as the organizer said, but still impressive numbers of people demonstrating in Nagata Chow. Every Friday, there were, I think, I'm pretty sure, 100,000 people in New York Park in the summer. Um, but it, were they that big, really? If, if, um, if a comparable disaster had happened in Western Europe, I can say with confidence you would have not tens of thousands, but millions on the streets. Um, and governments would, would topple very quickly. They may have seemed pretty big, those demonstrations, until you saw the numbers who turned out to see the Olympic athletes return from the London Olympics and parade through Ginza. That was a big demonstration. <laughs> when people came out to, to see the gold medals. I think the truth is, um, as we saw yesterday, that people do care about nuclear power as an issue, they worry. If you ask, do you want nuclear power, still it seems a majority say no. But they don't care enough not to vote for Mr. Abe. They care much more about the things that Mr. Abe is perceived to be doing well, such as giving the economy a kick. Um, and until that changes, until Japanese people care more and uh, Express that through the ballot box, then I think the um, the uh, nuclear village is going to is going to come back and continue to to dominate that industry. Uh, yeah, th unfortunately, this will be the last question. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Saraki Numata, and I used to be foreign minister spokesman in the late nineties. Fortunately, I was not a foreign ministry spokesman when the disaster happened. <laughs> but it is not out of uh, any desire for self flagellation that I'm going to ask the next question, which is that uh, you talked quite a bit about distrust in the media, which trusts too much the official. Though. Now, um, as a former spokesman, as I was watching how the government and TEPCO were handling the crisis communication, had I been there, I would, try, I would have tried to act a bit more differently. You mentioned, somebody mentioned the Speedy. That's one example. Whether or not there was a meltdown, that's another example. And uh, the magnitude of, uh, of the disaster, whether it was level five or level seven. In, in each of these instances, I think it would have been better to, be, to come out with what they had later came to admit. Uh, but I admit it's very, very difficult to do in the Japanese government context. So that is a preface to my question, which either we can uh, answer. Uh, what lessons should the official then draw from all this? I think as Mr. Snowden has showed us, it's also hard for the American government to come out and say everything. Um, so, so a lot of these issues, but that's a serious comment, a lot of these issues are, it's not a Japan-only issue. Mistrust in the media is not a Japan-only issue. Or government responses to disasters is certainly not a Japan-only issue. I mean, the easy answer is just to be more open because 
I mean, what the, the, the problem was is that they lost trust. And once they lost tra credibility, nobody would tr trust anything they said. And, and so it's true of the media, but it's also, I think, true of, of, of the government that once that credibility is lost, it's very hard to regain. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, that, that's sort of a facile answer. I don't, you know, it, it, it's obviously more difficult than that. And, uh, but, you know, like, for example, one of the interesting sort of differences in the response was where to draw the line for evacuations, right? Mm -hmm. And if you watch what happened after the Fukushima accident, it was like three kilometers, and it grew to like 10 and 20. And somewhere in the middle of that, the U.S. embassy came out, or the U.S. government came out with like 50 miles, you know, <laughs> it was like way out there. And, and, the, and, and that difference, I think, actually wasn't, you know, overreaction by the Americans or underreaction by the Japanese. I think it just sort of explained it. it, it well, it, it showed, I think, the difference in approach. The American approach was you consider it dangerous until you prove it safe. And the Japanese approach seemed to be the opposite. You consider it safe until you prove it dangerous. Um, the American response, though, shows a way that officials, that officials can respond to an accident in a way that ga gains more confidence. I think what the American response showed is they had more, they had more experience with dealing with these things. Um, and, and you know, you don't. You, I, mean, I guess you, know, you can't say everything you know, but but you can re you can respond in a way that inspires confidence. And I think that's maybe the lesson that I would you know, that that conf that credibility is really really important. It's, and it's very easy to lose, and it's very hard to regain. Thanks. Well, thanks for your question, Mr. Mata. Pleasure to see you again. I have, I have no doubt that things would have been very different if you'd been in charge. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's about, I mean, your question is, is very um, it's very difficult to answer simply. I mean, you, you could write libraries of books about it, no doubt some of them are being written now. I think the... I think what what should have been different is the relationship between the government and the nuclear industry. Um, from the very beginnings of the nuclear industry, um, the, the phrase was, was used quite early on of the disaster that it was an unimaginable disaster. It wasn't. Lots of people had imagined it. Lots of scientists had imagined it. They'd been ignored. The, the ideology of the nuclear village was that nuclear power was not just pretty safe, but completely 100% safe. Um, there was therefore no, it, it, would, it would not only have been um, a, a waste of time, it would have been reckless uh, and, and alarmist to have even discussed the possibility of, of such a disaster happening. Um, but isn't it so obvious now that in, in a country like Japan, which is so vulnerable seismically, which also has lots of nuclear power stations, in the lifetime of nuclear waste products, which is 10,000 years, um, you are going to get big, big shakes. Um, so what should have happened, or what, what needs to happen now, is that um, this becomes part of standard operating procedure, that immense, unimaginable uh, physical cataclysms like this are anticipated and planned for, so that when it does happen, everyone knows what to do. I had said that was the last question. In fact, I neglected someone who's been queued up and waiting for quite a long time. So this is, in fact, the last question. And we'll have to keep it rather brief. Thank you. Uh, first of all, sorry for taking the last question. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk. And uh, also, thank you very much for taking risks in your, in your daily jobs, which is a very admirable thing. Um, you both mentioned uh, failure in the media. And I just wanted to ask you both your personal opinions on what do you define as success in the media and also how do you think that the media would have been successful in the in the event what could they have done i think success is living up to the ideals i mean the media public public interest journalism right i mean the media is very broad. People talk about entertainment today and all sorts of stuff. But in public interest journalism, what 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 I try to practice, um, and, and what you would see like in serious newspapers and uh, 
know, serious television and whatnot. You have certain ideals, right? You have a certain image of what you're trying to do. You're trying to, you know, if you've heard all, all before, I get the truth out, be objective, whatever. But I think success would be living up to those ideals. Um, in the case of something like this, success would be maintaining a distance from authorities and, 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 and at the end of the day serving your readers, right? standing on the side of your readers and not on the side of your sources. Um, you know, uh, what, what could the journalists have done differently after March 11? You know, critical discussion of TEPCO, which I still haven't seen. I mean, why does this thing still exist? You know, I mean, the same guys run it anyways. Um, you know, a, a I mean, and, and that would be a good starting point. And, and the flow of money from TEPCO into everything else. I mean, it's just amazing this stuff is, you still don't see critical coverage of that. Asking those kinds of questions, you know, kind of figuring out what, you know, follow the money, what's, what's, the, what's the root cause, you know. Uh, you know, if there's a real weakness, I think, in the Japanese coverage of themselves in general, it's this tendency not to look for structural problems, not to kind of look for the bigger picture. It's like, you know, they, they, incidents are treated as sort of one-off random events, and there's no, you don't get enough of an effort to kind of look for what's really, is there something in the institution that's failed or in the political system that's failed. Um, but asking those kinds of questions, kind of a critical, you know, ability to look at oneself critically. Uh, I mean, I, you know, you, you get some of that, but even, you know, I haven't really seen the big, I mean, you get some of the nuclear village, you know, you, um, and, and, and the bureaucracy in particular is a favorite sort of target these days. Um, but there's still a lot of questions out there on, that are, have been left unasked. Um, so I would, I would say, you know, you need, you need to inform your readers as to what happened, why it happened, what were the problems. I mean, and that's, I guess, basically what journalism is all about. And so success, I think, is, is trying your best to fulfill that mission. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's not kind of an easy menu of check off this, this, okay, success. But, but basically, you have a sense of what you're supposed to do and doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, not only really briefly, just a, a couple of examples of, of what might have been measures of success for the foreign media if more people in the, the week after March the 11th, uh, foreigners living in Tokyo, had felt confident of, um, uh, of staying put and saying, well, things look rather dicey out there, but I'm, I'm just going to wait and see, because if it does all go to pieces up there, we'll have a few days of warning, so let's not panic, rather than fling to the airport on the next day, as many people did. And for the Japanese media, success would have been if, um, if there'd been a national debate about the safety of nuclear power 20 or 30 years earlier, um, at the time when the credible scientists were raising the first questions about the vulnerability of coastal nuclear power stations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very interesting.